Hey everybody, uh, just wanted to check in with you. Um, I'll be doing these uh, probably a little bit more often, uh, actually, particularly, <laughs> I gotta get a holder for this. Um, as the, uh, the book sort of accelerates, the pre-publication before the book that's coming out from Zero Books, my book, Against the Web, Cosmopolitan Socialist Answer to the IDW and the New Right. Hey, everybody. Um, and I'm doing more, a few more of these in general when I have time, but I did want to just talk specifically tonight about Bernie Sanders' address today on democratic socialism. Uh, this was really, really, really important for a number of reasons. And I think... I want to start at a much more grounded level um, that the speech really anchored on, which, you know, is obviously not going to get the sort of same attention, thank you, man, and fixation that uh, the word or the term democratic socialism is getting. But I want to start with Bernie absolutely correctly retrieving um, the lost legacy of FDR's call for an economic bill of rights. And I know that this brought obviously a huge smile to Harvey JK's uh, face. Harvey K of course is a, is a guest right frequently on TMBS and author of some really important books on subjects like Thomas Paine and the new deal. Thank you so much squirrel. Um, definitely, uh, all, uh, uh, super chat donations are usually helpful and appreciated. So what Bernie did when he talked about the Economic Bill of Rights is I think re-anchor the real contours of this race and latch onto a legacy to remind you about why it isn't just the fact that Bernie's the best candidate. It's, as Ben Burgess says, it's a question of he's a candidate of a different kind. He's tapping into a legacy, which very much certainly includes a. Philip Randolph, Eugene Debs, Martin Luther King Jr., the March on Washington, but it also does include FDR. And I think we need to, particularly as you run an actual national presidential campaign, uh, be real about that, um, you know, in terms of recognizing FDR's legacy, having a complex conversation about him, but also recognizing that for campaign purposes and for what FDR has done um, in terms of generating programs that still benefit people to this day <laughs> with regards to these incredible accomplishments like Social Security, that the Economic Bill of Rights that FDR proposed a year before he died, which would ensure uh, four, uh, four freedoms and different steps to economic security and Bernie's expansion on them today to include things like a clean environment, but of course, the other core issues that he campaigns on, Medicare for all, free college all the way through. He added affordable housing, which is huge. We're gonna need some real aggressive socialist rent control and public housing uh, policies for sure. Um, was in fact claiming the mantle of a really potent democratic tradition. So that it fits together in a way that's distinct. And I've made this point in a couple of ways. You can basically ask all of the other Democratic candidates, your Buttigiegs, your Bidens, your O'Rourke's, your Bookers, whatever. Let's make this really simple. Do you support completing the New Deal or not? Do you support the Economic Bill of Rights? And you know, the, uh, the Progressive Economic Pledge that Jank put together is a helpful reflection of this. But in the specificity of latching on to that historical lineage and linking it with the absolutely, in fact, really simple questions of today. Do you support Medicare for all? Simple. There is no uh, reason for any type of maneuvering or attempts to complexify that. Ask them that. And then I think, you know, again, and this is the sort of broader argument of the speech when we get into democratic socialism, and we've been really seeing it with Bernie uh, throughout this whole campaign in a couple of different ways. One, there is an understanding that he is putting forward that in order to defeat oligarchy and authoritarianism, 
we are going to need to respond to the material conditions and crisis that feeds and generates it, along with aggressively safeguarding democracy and fighting, defeating, and uprooting racism, bigotry, and xenophobia in all of its forms. And so that connected with then the other hugely important element of this, which is that he is gonna to need to mobilize and any progressive leader, any left leader is gonna to need to mobilize millions of people to pass any serious left agenda. And so this is where the really important distinctions with Elizabeth Warren come in. You know, in one specific way, obviously, uh, the fact that she isn't clear and unequivocal about Medicare for all is a massive red flag and is disqualifying in a race where there is somebody who's 100% clear about Medicare for all. That is 100% non-negotiable and that is policy-based. But the broader argument here and the broader potential we have that is just objectively historically unique in modern politics with Bernie Sanders is to have somebody that understands that fundamentally capitalism and democracy are in tension they do not necessarily work together. In fact, capitalism is in fact very anti-democracy in many key respects. So that we need at the very least a frame and an intellectual understanding of taming capitalism beyond simply regulation. Actually some path to broader democracy. And the Economic Bill of Rights is a reflection of understanding, and Bernie is quite robust on this, that those really important freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, of course we need to and we must protect and safeguard those, that those are also functionally meaningless if you're starving, if you don't have access to life. Um, you know, uh, that famous quote, which I'll paraphrase of, you know, liberalism allows uh, both the rich man and the poor man to sleep under a bridge. And then the recognition that with inside that framework, you need a profound, profoundly activated populace because this is going to be a full-on political battle. You know, one of the things that does concern me with regards to Warren is that people are getting so fixated on these policy proposals. And look, what you need is you need clear markers. And I think, frankly, one area in which Sanders and Warren are the standouts is I believe them that they will fight firmly uh, for key aspects of their policy agenda. But on the other hand, the dialectic of policy is that on one hand, it just needs to be simple. People don't need to read a whole bunch of stuff. They don't need to walk out. Most people are not going to do that, nor do they need to do that. What I need to know in a paragraph is, are you for Medicare for all, free college, uh, affordable or free housing, uh, ending fossil fuel dependency, and um, massive, and Bernie used the word recently, massive cancellation of student debt. That's what I need to know. And then on the flip side, what any of these politicians, including by the way, even if it was some disastrous, uh, you know, shallow neoliberal agenda that a candidate like Buttigieg represents, if you go up against incumbent interests, and it would be the most extreme in Bernie's case, and then in the second case, uh, Warren, and then say in, in Gabbard's case, if she went after the defense establishment, let's take say that hypothetically, it's not about who wrote the best policy. The reason that we have Silicon Valley monopolies running our country, the reason that we have Wall Street can, engaging in criminal acts and profound unethical behavior that melted the global economy. The reason we have defense contractors continuing to steer resources uh, through Congress and the Trump administration and push for, uh, to help fuel and supply a genocide in Yemen is because of power and money, not because of intellectual argumentation. Those things are important, but they're second order things. So it's very concerning to me when people get so fixated on policy and they're not really contemplating what you actually need to do in order to win these fights. Bernie Sanders 
gets that. And that is the key fundamental distinction of having a democratic socialist standpoint and a rigorous understanding of power. And it's also, by the way, another massive distinction with him because in the areas where he's wrong and the areas where he needs to be pushed, which frankly, I have to say in the context of this campaign are very few, he is gonna be the one that first of all is gonna have by far, not even just, again, it's not just even the best instincts, a different set of instincts coming from a different background and different politics. And he will want you organizing on those vital issues. That is a complete, complete distinction. I, of course, I have to mention that Bernie came out unapologetically and in a profoundly strong way calling for freeing Lula, right? And it matters because, you know, in 2018, when apparently this was a bigger risk, uh, I never thought that obviously the case was obviously what it was. And, and frankly, I, you know, I should not have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, so lonely along with Brazil Wire and then, you know, Anna Kasparian doing amazing work and some others. But it's a travesty that AOC hasn't said anything. And uh, uh, Tulsi, you know, again, profoundly ran Paul of her, profoundly Ron Paul of her to not say something about Lula. And Elizabeth Warren has a mediocre to atrocious foreign policy in general. But what Bernie said about Lula was, he said, I join other politicians and movement leaders around the world. There's no cost for AOC to call for Lula to be released. Sorry, this one you gotta be clear with her on. It's wrong and it's also a big problem in my estimation. I will strongly critique her if she doesn't endorse Sanders. Uh, if you're gonna represent a brand of democratic socialism, he's the candidate. And I think we need to be very clear about that. But in linking himself to that internationalism, to that solidarity, that is not only the right kind of politics, it's unprecedented in modern politics. So the guy in the speech today in the campaign that they're running so far, is not only moving in the right direction on so many key issues, but he is giving us the template to critique him, to say, you know what, Bernie, you need a robust plan to destroy ICE, to end the terrorism of, of migrant communities, something uh, profoundly humane and progressive on immigration. You know, we need a rethink of the drone program. You need to say, regardless of what you think of Julian Assange, hate, loathe, detest, or love him, or think he's a political prisoner, whatever. It really doesn't matter. These espionage charges against him are a fundamental threat to us. He's giving you the template for how to do it. And on so many issues now, on domestic policy, where he's recreated the whole template, you know, this is the other major reason that he needs to be supported is because he already did the job of 2016. He's moved the party to the left in terms of rhetoric, in terms of policy set. And now it's about actually remaking these institutions and the context in which politics happens. And once again, he's the only one with a clear conversation about that, a clear plan for that. So I think from these kind of broader internationalist things that I'm getting into, a principled understanding that democratic socialism and we played a great clip of Olaf Palm, the great Swedish social democratic leader, uh, last night in the post game. And he made the point that, you know, in this great clip that like, look, there is a tradition of social democracy, democratic socialism, that got every single historical call right of the 20th century against fascism, against Stalinism, and against imperialism and colonialism. Palm uh, was a strong supporter of the ANC and a strong opponent of the US genocide in Vietnam. So what this emphasizes is it's a roadmap to action. It's a description of democratic socialism as in fact, not just some sort of antiquated slogan that people are attached to, but the exact winning formula in the United States and Europe that defeated the forces that we see amassing today, 
in with Trump and the Republicans and across the globe and Netanyahu and Modi and Orban and Bolsonaro and you know all of the and Duterte and and all of the usual Putin and the list of those types of authoritarian leaders. And then when you talk about the second Bill of Rights, economic Bill of Rights, you are saying, look, guys, you can uh, run around and say anything you want and mock this lineage, mock this politics. But in fact, now when you're mocking Bernie Sanders and dismissing Bernie Sanders, you're dismissing the most powerful and empowering elements of the democratic tradition. Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, Eugene Debs, FDR, and so on. And you can lay claim to that and fight it vigorously. So look, uh, this guy is a different kind of candidate. He's the best candidate. I, you know, this is why I have chosen to sort of not do a kind of pretend process. I, I, I think, um, you know, for me, it, it's just so crucial. And I, I understand, you know, there's a lot of people that are really um, excellent and they're doing amazing work and, they're, and they want to elevate the whole field, which is also a really smart call. Um, and so I understand that even if I have some disagreements with it. But then there's other people who don't have the same democratic socialist commitments and they're migrating to other candidates and they're drawing false equivalencies to undermine something that really is distinctly historically necessary. And it has nothing to do with thinking Bernie is perfect or any of that. I mean, that's all just a stupid conversation. Nobody's perfect. But the context of this campaign and what Bernie offers is unprecedented uh, in modern politics. And also, you know, this also goes, I think, for people who, again, when it comes to actual substance, when Bernie needs to be critiqued on something that's actually a mistake, yes, we need to make it in a principled way. But I also, you know, this sort of like, oh, here's a contrarian take. Bernie's not the most left wing or, you know, or, or like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm angry at Bernie because he didn't reprint and read out, you know, uh, the Cuban uh, government's official stance on Venezuela. It's like, okay, great, whatever. We can get you know a lot of uh, nice uh, you know uh, retweets, but let's be real here. We're trying to do something, and uh, this election with Bernie. And if you ask anybody in another country um, who has left convictions and is concerned about imperialism, they're going to beg you to vote for this guy. So it was a really important critique. I saw that uh, one about uh, a sad face emoji for 49,000 subscribers. Actually, 49,000 is pretty good. Um, we've only been on YouTube, not even since the summer, and then we only really started putting more energy into it when we got monetized uh, in the winter. But I just wanna say that we're only actually a couple away from crossing our first 50,000, which is a huge benchmark, apparently. And of course, the first real serious goal is to get 100,000 as quickly as possible. When we get to 50,000, apparently, that's going to be another big breakthrough for us. So, uh, you know, click subscribe if you haven't already. Spread the word. And the whole way that this gets to happen and the whole context for understanding, uh, you know, the situation we're in and really with that global perspective um, and there's going to be a lot more in terms of us showing you about the illicit histories and all the stuff you get as Patreons. Uh, you got to go and become a patron. Patreon.com slash TMBS. That's how the whole thing rolls. How many of you, uh, those of you in the chat who are patrons, could somebody say something about how great the illicit histories and idea primers are or the post games and probably that we do not do as good a job selling them as we should? <laughs> Juan, I will never stop. I'm a socialist. Uh, so post games are amazing. Um, yeah, post games are hilarious. I mean, post games is like, post games are when we're in like the Thomas Sankara meets Howard Stern mode. Um, and then, uh, yeah, illicit histories. I mean, I think when you, when you listen to things like the illicit histories, you are getting, again, like a grasp of global politics. Oh, boo. 
Only the Chapo, you are banned from the chat. Whack. Uh, Gulag is going to come back for some things, for sure. Um, I mean, all love the Chapo, but please. I mean, we got to TMBS, please. I mean, but of course, I'd stack this show up against any show, obviously, but that's just how I roll. So, um, we're going to actually be giving you kind of more clips and things like that uh, to get a sense of all of the additional post-game content. And I also say, like, you know, uh, yeah, just, just be in touch. Let me know if you have any questions. And uh, Allah walk bar. Peace and love. Lula Livre. And I really appreciate all of you guys. Take care. Much love.